Hello guys, how's it going? My name is Dalrin, and in today's video, I'll be doing a guide for all the mythic dungeons in Shadowlands. I wanted to make this video a lot earlier, but I thought maybe we should wait until the expansion release to make a guide for all the dungeons. You never know what mechanics are going to change, and these dungeons have changed quite a lot from their inception to now. In this video, I'm going to cover all the different mechanics that every single boss in this dungeon has, and what are some of the different things you can do inside of these dungeons to make them easier when it comes to running them in Mythic, in preparation for the Mythic Plus season, which releases, I believe, in about a week. I have ran these dungeons on three alts now, and I feel like I know them like the back of my hand. The mechanics for these eight dungeons are not the craziest that I've ever seen. I feel like some of them are a step up from the BFA dungeons, but anyway, let's get into this guide for today's video. The first dungeon is known as Halls of Atonement. It is a Venthyr-centered dungeon, and in this dungeon, being Venthyr, you will have a chance to mind control gargoyles scattered all over the place. These gargoyles give your party a little bit of a DR when it comes to taking damage, but also add extra damage themselves as their auto attacks do quite a lot and they also come handy with good AoE damage. Being able to use these gargoyles in trash bags that are tough or against bosses is going to make a big difference. The first dungeon boss is Halkias. Halkias has a couple mechanics. The one prominent one is a big red ring around him. Stay within the circle to not get constantly feared. If any of your party members are found outside of this ring, you're basically going to get feared forever. Halkias also has two main attacks. One of them is a slam, which will target a tank. The other ability is called Heavier Debris. Whenever Halkias slams the tank or throws debris around, it will leave Puddle on the ground. Standing in the puddle will cause damage, so you have to use a lot of the room given to fight this boss in order to move him around. It's going to become a lot more important to utilize as much of this room as possible on tyrannical weeks. Finally, Halkias does Refracted Sunlight. He'll start kind of spinning in a circle in either direction and can switch with these massive red beams. Avoid the beams and try not to take too much damage. This boss is pretty straightforward, but definitely having yourself enough room and positionals is going to be important for this guy. Next boss is Echelon. The main mechanic for Halkis is going to be summoning Stone Fiends, which will cast Villainous Bolt. Try to interrupt Villainous Bolt and get these fiends together. The more clumped up these adds die, the better because these adds don't really die. They instead turn to stone and begin to regenerate. And you'll use some of the Echelon abilities in order to finally break these adds, removing them completely. Ad management is the name of the game here, so you want to make sure you're not overwhelmed with too many of those imps. Periodically, Echelon will cast Curse of Stone, which is a curse that's dispellable, but it will turn all of your party members slowly into stone and stun you during which time Echelon selects one of the party members and performs a stone shattering leap. The idea is to take all these adds, clump them together, kill them and have them all turn to stone very close in proximity together and then aim Echelon's leap into these adds. The person getting leapt on is going to take a little bit of damage, mostly as a damage over time, but using this ability properly will allow you to take control of these adds. Try to make sure not too many people are caught in a leap because that'll be too much damage for your healer to deal with. Over time, Echelon is also going to cast Blood Torrent, which will put a bleed on the ground and eventually, the longer this fight goes on, the less room you really have to play with. So you kind of want to nuke this boss very quickly. The next boss is High Adjudicator Elise. This boss has a couple different mechanics. It is going to be also another partial ad management fight, although it'll be a ghost that you cannot see. Inside of the fight, there will be four anima canisters, and then from time to time, a ghost will spawn and chase one of your party members. The ghost does AoE damage, and it's going to be more damage in proximity, so you want to make sure this ghost is kept away from most of your party. Run this ghost into the anima canisters in order to get rid of it, but there are only four anima canisters available at the beginning of the fight, so it's kind of a DPS race to take down the boss before you are overwhelmed with too many ghosts. The boss will also cast two abilities, Bolt of Power and Volley of Power. Bolt of Power will do damage to the tank, Volley will do damage to the group, and are both interruptible, so interrupt rotation is going to be necessary. Finally, the boss will use the Anima Fountain to create massive red swirlies. Just try to avoid the extra AoE damage and try to deal with the ghosts as quickly and efficiently as possible, and make sure to focus down the boss before they overwhelm you. 
Then we have the Lord Chamberlain. A couple of mechanics will happen with this boss as his main three abilities are going to be Stigma of Pride, which is a tank damage over time, which is going to be up to the tanks and healers to communicate how you deal with the damage. Unleash Suffering, which will be a frontal cone that should be easy to be dodged, as well as Telekinetic Toss, where he picks up one of the statues and tosses it. If you want to find out which way the statue is going to be tossed, it's in the direction that it is facing. So just try not to be in the path of the facing statue. At 70 and 40%, Lord Chamberlain will use a Chamberlain Chorus, where he'll kind of reposition the statues and do an ability called Ritual of Woe, where he will channel to each of these statues, which will do AoE damage if it hits the statue. Otherwise, it will hit the person soaking the beam. Basically, you want four out of the five party members to soak it, utilizing party utility and group utility in order to mitigate the damage. Another ability that I found kind of rare to see is an AoE Nova. From time to time, the boss will create ground red and will do an AoE explosion. If you're a melee, be sure to get out of it before the cast finishes. The next dungeon is called Sanguine Depths, another Venthyr focused dungeon. In this dungeon, you'll have these anima cages, where upon activation, it'll start siphoning anima out of nearby enemies. When those enemies are slain, you get a buff of 5% damage and healing per enemy slain. So being able to clump up enemies and nuking them near these anima cages is going to be helpful. The first boss is Crixus. He has a couple different mechanics. First of them will be Hungering Drain. This ability needs to be interrupted immediately, otherwise the boss gets a massive buff from it. Then we have an ability called Ferocious Headbutt. This damage will do a lot of damage to the tank, so coordinate with your tanks and healers in order to mitigate this damage. The boss will sometimes cast Juggernaut Rush, where he selects a player and will charge right through them. Just like in third boss of King's Rest, the more bodies are between the boss and the targeted player, the less damage the targeted player will take or you can always use immunities during this phase. Another ability this boss does once he reaches 100 energy is Severing Smash. Everybody in the group will take a bit of damage and get knocked back, spawning living essence orbs. Running through these orbs does group wide damage. You want to make sure these orbs do not reach the boss. So if you want to deal with these orbs, either blow a healer cooldown and then take all the orbs at once, or stagger the orb, pick up one at a time to make it easier for your healer to catch up with the healing. The next boss is called Executor Tarvold. With this boss, you will notice two massive beams that will be kind of spinning around the massive circular arena that you'll be fighting the boss in. One of the beams will be on the outside of the circle and the other will be on the inside and it will be going in different directions. Don't tank the boss where you get him pulled from because that's where the beams cross and you want to make sure you don't get hit by those beams. Another ability he'll do is castigate. He'll mark a random player and it'll make him take damage and everybody around the player also takes damage. Try to make sure to isolate that player. He also spawns an ad and the ad needs to be nuked pretty quickly. Otherwise, the ad grows and does more damage over time. But once the ad dies, it also creates a puddle on the ground, so you want to make sure to have plenty of room to move the boss around as you kill these manifestations. And that's a very simple fight at first, but with a bit of a dance you have to do with the adds, the puddles on the ground, and the beam that goes around the room, it does get a little bit hectic. Next we have a boss called Grand Proctor, and with this boss you'll have a couple different mechanics. The main one is going to be Iron Spikes that the tank will be stabbed with. Again, another tank mechanic where the tank will just take a lot of damage. Then she does Rite of Supremacy, where she will do a lot of AoE damage to groups and achieve a little bit of damage over time as well. To mitigate this damage, there will be golden orbs that will spawn inside of the room. Grab at least three of them on Mythic Zero and you'll probably need more of them at higher Mythic Plus category in order to deal with the damage and mitigate it. Another ability she does is Endless Torment, where she torments a Naru to unleash a bunch of holy damage all over the room. Make sure to dodge the yellow swirlies. And that's going to be all about what you have to do for this boss. Actually, pretty simple. Finally, we have General Call. A couple different mechanics that General Call will do. First of all, she slaps tanks around. So your tanks are going to take a lot of damage baseline. The general call is also going to mark two players, sometimes can be ranged, sometimes can be melee, and she will charge to those two players. When she reaches the player, she'll do this AoE flurry that will put damage over time on nearby allies. 
General Call is also going to segment portions of the room into thirds and have these illusionary versions of her kind of slice through the floor. Make sure you're not standing in the way of those illusions. Finally, she'll use Gloom Squall, which is a massive knockback, and you have to use the Nari you got from the third boss in order to drop down a defensive buff and also prevent any knockbacks with this boss. This extra action button also removes all bleeds, so as General Kal maintains and attains bleeds on all the party members, you'll be able to remove them temporarily, allowing your healer to catch up. The interesting part about this boss fight is it ends when General Call hits 50%, so you don't actually have to kill this boss, you just have to get him low enough. The next dungeon is called Spires of Ascension. It's a Kyrian dungeon, and the Kyrian can find dead Kyrians from time to time and interact with them to pick up a Spear of Destiny. Spear of Destiny can be used to stun enemies in an AoE area for 10 seconds, allowing you to also do 20% more damage to those enemies. The first boss is going to be Kintara. Kintara and her pet are bound together and they have kind of like a health link going on, so they both share health. They're both linked with this beam and you want to make sure as a melee you don't stand between Kintara and Azul's the pet because the beam does apply a damage over time ability and you don't want to rack up more dots for your healer to have to juggle your health as well as the tanks. Kintara also does a frontal on the tank, make sure as a melee that you're not in front of it, otherwise overhead slash is going to do a lot of group damage. From time to time, Kintara is going to take up into the air, flying around throwing a charged spear at random allies. Azul's the whole fight is going to fly from one corner of the map to another and then spray a frontal which can be avoided. Just make sure you don't stand in front of him because if you get hit by all the missiles at the same time that's most likely going to be a one shot. This fight has quite a bit of movement so for any casters with multi-dot capabilities this is going to be your favorite fight. The next boss is called Ventunax. Ventunax's main ability is going to be Dark Stride where they will kind of shadow step to an ally and they will cast Shadow Whirl, which will create this swirl on the ground that will fire projectiles which will do damage and knock you up into the air. The longer the fight goes on, the more swirls there are on the ground. That means also more projectiles to dodge. So this boss is going to be very interesting on Tyrannical Weak. The boss will also cast Blinding Flash from time to time. Just make sure you're not in front of this ability so you're not blinded. Especially important for tanks so they don't lose aggro. When this boss runs out of energy, they'll cast ability of recharge, where they'll start recharging their energy. While that is happening, all those whirling things on the ground will start firing off even more projectiles, getting a lot more aggressive. So it's going to be a lot harder for you to dodge every single one of them. Be sure to be on the lookout and for a tank, keep the boss the furthest you can from all those projectiles. Positionals are also going to be very, very important. So maybe having like a kind of like a soft stack in the group or like a little bit of a spread stack, at least not super far from another, will allow you to position these worlds far enough away in order to deal with them much easier. The next boss is going to be Orifiron. Orifiron will use charge stomp on the tank. Make sure no nearby enemies are near the tank to take extra dot damage. Coordinate between your tank and the healer to mitigate this damage. Another ability he'll use is Purifying Blast, where he'll mark a random player and will blast them. Again, make sure that no one is near that player because it'll put a little bit of a damage over time afterwards. Then he'll also use an ability called Empyrean Ordnance, which will be marked on top of where players stand. The easiest strategy for this is to stack up in one area and then move the boss away from this ordinance. Ordnance is going to leave a puddle on the ground that will do damage, so make sure you don't stand in it. Make sure to stack Imperial Ordnance as close to each other as you can, so it heads towards the boss in almost a linear fashion, because it'll be a lot easier to deal with it on Mythic difficulty. After this boss runs out of anima, all the Ordnance anima pulls on the ground will turn into orbs and will begin slowly floating towards the boss. Make sure to have somebody, maybe with an immunity or a tank, soak these orbs one at a time. This is going to deal quite hefty amount of damage and in higher keys it will also do even more damage. During the time that the boss is drained of anima, he'll have a debuff called Drained where he takes 100% bonus damage. So be sure to save all your big bursty cooldowns during this phase. Finally we have Devos and Devos has a couple different mechanics. 
First, Devas will use an ability called Run Through, where she will target a random player and charge right through them and go kind of far. She kind of charges out of the way, so this might be a difficult fight for melee unless you're able to have her charge into a wall so you don't have to go super far. She'll also mark two players with Lost Confidence debuff, where once dispelled, it'll drop a puddle on the ground. The healer needs to dispel these debuffs as soon as possible. Another mechanic will happen is Abyssal Detonation. Devas will stand in place and detonate an Abyssal Charge, which will do raid-wide damage, so be sure to jump into Archon's Bastion, which will be this blue orb shield thing, in order to avoid that damage. When Devas reaches 70% and 30% health, Phase 2 will begin, where Devas will take up into the air and start doing damage to the full party, with these puddles kind of moving back and forth from the arena. Try to stay out of those puddles as they do put up a nasty dot, which can be dispelled by the healer, but if you have too many of those dots and too many stacks going out, that can be overwhelming. During this phase, five animal orbs will appear, and everybody in the group has to run up and grab those orbs, bring them to the spear in the middle. Then one of the party members, once the spear is charged, can interact with the spear and try to knock devils out of the sky. Be sure to wait until Devil stops moving before you throw the spear. This will go on until Devos is dead, and remember, you have two phases where she goes up into the air. The next dungeon is Necrotic Wake. It's a carrion inspired dungeon and is going to have carrion specific mechs, where you have to use your steward in order to resuscitate those mechs and use their anima in order to buff yourselves, giving you a buff where you do AoE damage but also AoE healing. Also throughout this dungeon are a bunch of carrion weapons scattered all over the place. Shields, hammers, and spears. Utilizing these weapons in order to deal with trash bags and bosses is going to be something for you to think about when it comes to approaching this dungeon and making it far easier. Flyborn has two big mechanics. One of them is going to be called Heaving Wretch. Heaving Wretch basically makes him vomit in a direction. He'll mark a player with a green arrow above their head and will kind of retch forwards, which will spawn carrion worms that will focus on a player and will try to bite them. When the worms get three bites off, they will explode doing AoE damage to the raid, and this damage is permanent dot, so make sure those worms do not get their three bites off. When the worms die, they leave a massive puddle on the ground. The boss will also use the ability Crunch on the tank, which will do quite a bit of damage from time to time. The boss will also use the ability Fetid Gas, where the boss releases, well, a gas, but also marks off even more area where you cannot stand. Standing in the puddle of disease is going to silence you, so you have to utilize a massive, massive arena in order to kite this boss around to various places. So clearing a lot of the trash around the boss is going to be something you might want to think about. The next boss is Amarth. He'll cast Necrotic Bolt a lot at the tank. Be sure to have an interpretation in order to deal with it. Amarth sometimes enrages, so having a way to de-enrage the boss is also going to be helpful. He also casts Land of the Dead, where like an Unholy Death Knight, he summons a whole army of undead, which will have mages, will have warriors, but also will have archers. Try to group up and nuke him down as soon as possible. Amarth will periodically also cast Necrotic Breath, where the dragon will kind of just belch Necrotic Breath forwards and spin around the room. Be sure to stay away from it as a caster or as a melee. His final ability is Final Harvest. For every undead that is still alive, Amarth is going to do insane amounts of damage to everybody in the room, and also will get a buff. The less undead are alive, which should be zero, the better, as the boss will maintain a stacking damage buff over time, continuously doing more damage to the party as he goes on. So you kind of want to rush this boss as best as possible, control the adds and nuke him down as soon as you can, control the cast of this boss by interrupting and trying to kind of de-enrage the boss whenever possible to try to manage the damage that will be going out. The next boss is Stitch Flesh. Stitch Flesh creations are going to use Mutilate on the tank which will do quite a bit of tank damage. And also Stitch Flesh creations will target one random party member and will try to throw a hook at them. Aim the hook at Stitch Flesh from his podium to bring him down and do as much damage as you can at him. And try to maintain this ad at all times, or at least maintain one ad available with Stitch Flesh so you can throw more hooks at him. Surgeon Stitch Flesh will do a couple different things. 
he'll put dots on everybody he'll throw embalming ichor all over the room which will also create plague where you cannot stand and he'll use an ability called morbid fixation where during this boss is going to attack one of your party members and try to focus them down Outrunning him isn't a good idea, so maintaining one of the creations nearby to hook him out of his fixation is probably the best choice in this scenario. So you don't really want to kill the ad, you want to utilize the ad, but also Stitch Flesh will summon ads over time, so you want to make sure you don't have more than one ad around. Use the ad to hook the boss off the platform, and use the ad to hook the boss from his morbid fixation in order to deal with all these mechanics while also trying to make sure to kill the boss fast enough before the full room is consumed in plague. There's also just a lot of AoE damage that goes on, so there's going to be a fight for your healers and tanks to mitigate. The last boss of this dungeon is Nalthor. Nalthor's first ability is going to be Frozen Binds, where he'll root a player and will create a blue circle around them. Make sure that nobody is inside of the blue circle before the player's root is dispelled, otherwise you risk rooting the rest of the party inside of that circle. You will want to make sure your allies are dispelled before Comet Storm goes off, where Comets are going to fly from the sky, so you want to be mobile and not rooted in order to avoid this damage. The boss will also do a lot of magic damage to the tank, so coordinate with the tanks and healers for more of a magic defensive build and maybe even certain cooldowns because tanks and healers and everybody in the group from all the magic damage are going to get shredded. He'll also kind of abduct players and throw them into this gauntlet, where you have to reach the end of the gauntlet and fight one of his siphoners. Killing a siphoner releases the Kyrian at the end of the run, and the Kyrian will take you back up to the platform. You want to do this before the debuff timer runs out. The longer you stay on the side, the bigger the buff of Frigid Wind is going to be. When you get back up to the platform, after 4 seconds Frigid Wind is going to drop, and it will kind of create an AoE frosty area on the ground. But when you come back from the gauntlet, you also have 100% critical strike chance. So try to combine some cooldowns for a DPS in order to do the most amount of damage during this phase. Finally, the boss will also cast a shield on himself. This shield needs to be broken as soon as possible with the DPS. The next dungeon is Plaguefall, and it's a Necalord dungeon where Necalord Fleshcraft ability can be used on various slimes in this dungeon in order to empower yourself. You have a variety of different buffs from providing haste buff to your allies to simply doing more damage to enemies or even giving your allies a slight damage reduction. And there will be a variety of different slimes of different colors. The red give haste, purple slime give defensive and green slimes give you extra damage. The first boss is going to be Glob Grorg. With this boss you'll have a couple different mechanics. First of all, Plague Stump. It's just an ability that does AoE damage, puts damage over time on your party and knocks everybody back. Then he also does Slime Wave, which is a dodgeable ability, make sure you are not in the way. Finally, this boss is going to summon Slimes. These Slimes are going to heal the boss when they reach him. There will be three small Slimes and one big Slime. Make sure, no matter what you do, the big Slime never touches the boss, otherwise you are never going to get this fight finished. The thing you do with the Slimes is you can crowd control them. You can fear them, you can root them, slow them, stun them, so you utilize everything in your CC toolkit in order to deal with them. Sometimes you might even be able to use certain hard CC like Druid Roots to perma root slimes in place. So utilize your CC toolkit for all your different classes. The big slime can also be CC'd with hard CC, like Blind as well as Trap, which is a pretty useful option that a lot of groups utilize. So, there's a variety of different ways to deal with this boss, as he ends up being pretty easy first one. The next boss is Dr. Ictus. There are a couple of basic abilities Dr. Ictus will do. He'll summon a slime that will try to transform, which can be bursted down or literally stepped on in order to destroy it. He'll also use slime injection on the tank, which can be dispelled by the healer. If there's no tank next to Dr. Ictus, he'll start throwing down slimes, which can be interrupted, so either a ranged interrupt or a tank interrupt is necessary there. At 70% and 30%, Dr. Ictus will shift to a different platform, summoning a Plague Bomb. Make sure your DPS are burning down the Plague Bomb as soon as possible. Dr. Ictus will also summon a slime. The slime is going to be a purple slime that will give a buff to any allies nearby, reducing the damage they take heavily. Make sure to tank Dr. Ictus and the slime away from the plague slime. Refresh and repeat until the boss is dead. And again, make sure to keep the purple slime away from the plague slime. 
The next boss is Domina Venom Blade. We kind of got to stay near one another with Domina Venom Blade because when you're too far out from your allies, then the boss will eventually wrap you up in a cocoon. So make sure you stay next to your allies, especially when they have mechanics where they got to run out. The boss will mark from time to time one of your allies with Shadow Ambush, where they will do AoE stun damage to everybody near the ally. Move away from your allies in order to reduce how many people get hit by the stun. As soon as someone gets stunned, you should have a ranged or a melee run next to them in order to avoid the player getting webbed. Also, the boss will spawn adds. The adds will be invisible inside of spider webs. If you run to the middle of the spider web, you'll be able to get the ad out. You better get them out, otherwise the adds stack a pretty nasty poison dot on everybody. Finally, we have Margrave Stradma. With Margrave Stradma, it's going to be a lot of tentacles. So dodging tentacles is the name of the game. Every so often, the Margrave will spawn an ad. The ad will do this constant smash in a circular area where the tank needs to soak it. Focus down the ad as soon as you can. At 60% and 30%, Margrave is going to go under in the slime, where tentacles are then going to spawn, and it will try to slap the party around in a variety of different patterns. Try to avoid these tentacles as best as you can, and learn the patterns as you do this dungeon a few times. Periodically, Margrave is also going to cast Infectious Rain, which is a disease that can be dispelled by priests as well as paladins, which will apply quite a pretty big dot on your whole party. On Tyrannical Wigs, this dot is going to hurt even more. During the technical phases, the boss is also going to spawn adds, which will be very similar adds as the ones you would fight before fighting this boss. Those adds do a lot of damage, but are very, very slow. So dot them up and try to keep them away from your group as best as possible. Try to have your tank hold the aggro without really getting into melee, which sounds like a tall order, but that's basically how you have to fight this boss. Then we have Theater of Pain, which is another Necrolord dungeon. Inside of Theater of Pain, there will be these banners, and interact with the banners will give your party 10% versatility and 10% movement speed. Utilize it in order to deal with trash packs and or bosses. We got three bosses in this fight. Desia the Decapitator is going to try to decapitate the tank. They all apply Mortal Strike with the healing reduction and slam the tank quite hard. Desia will also put up a 30% health shield from time to time, and it will need to be removed with enrage removing effects. Otherwise, this boss is going to truck one of your party members down. Sathel the Accursed is the caster of the group. He'll put up a 30% shield and become uninterruptible when the shield lasts. Break through his shield as soon as you see it. And Parseron the Virulent will put a bunch of noxious boards everywhere, teleport quite often, and cast a lot of spells. Try to interrupt them to put them together into the group. And you will also have a rogue kind of approaching from the shadows, stunning and ambushing one of your party members. This rogue needs to be CC'd with stun effects ASAP in order to break your parties out of crowd control. For boss number two, we have Gorchop. His main mechanic is going to be walls of chains going from side to side. Avoid those chains as the fight goes on. Gorchop will also summon adds throughout the fight, and if those adds die, they will drop plague on the ground. Eventually, you will run out of room. Besides that, Gorchop slams your tank pretty hard. He will also cast Tenderize and Smash, where he will pull nearby party members towards himself and try to slam them. Run out as soon as you get pulled by this ability. Then we have Zav the Unfallen, the PvP boss. He does a couple things. First of all, hits the tank generally pretty hard. He has an attack called Oppressive Banner, where he drops down a banner that will slow down everyone's movement speed stacking, so you have to take it out very, very quickly. He also does this three-part combo with a Crushing Slam, Massive Cleave, and Definite Clash. Any of those abilities can come in at any time. They will mostly be frontals or an AoE. He also throws down players into a battlefield arena, making two players fight each other where the winner gets 10% more damage and the loser gets 10% less damage. In Mythic Pluses, I'm pretty sure whoever has the most DPS is going to be the winner. Then we have ourselves Cool Tharok. This boss has a few mechanics like Phantasmal Parasite, where they will apply a debuff to two allies, and the healer needs to dispel one of them and heal the other, so coordinate with your healer how you deal with this mechanic, as the damage can be quite high. 
She also does the ability called Draw Soul, where they will draw a champion's soul. And after the soul is drawn from you, you have to actually catch a green ghost. To make this mechanic easier to do, you can stand in grasping hands on the ground, which will do a little bit of damage to you, but they will also root the soul, making it easier to pick it up. After you pick up your soul, you'll actually come back doing a little bit more damage to the boss. And finally, we have Mordretha. This boss has a couple different mechanics. First of all, there will be a frontal knockback that will kind of sweep in a circular motion with dark devastation. You also have manifest death where the boss will spawn green circles under you. And in mythic difficulty, once the circles finish, they'll also spawn adds, which will start casting at your allies. Another ability boss does is grasp and rift, where you'll try to pull your party team members into this rift. And if you get pulled, you get stunned, which can be dispelled with cursed dispellers. At 50% health, the boss casts Carnage, where echoes of battle will sometimes manifest themselves. They'll either be soldiers fighting one another or bulls charging in through the middle, and a lot of these mechanics overlap. The next dungeon is The Other Side, which is a dungeon that favors the Night Fae. Inside the dungeon you have urns that can be interacted by Night Fae players that will stun any nearby enemies. It is mostly used to deal with some powerful enemies inside of the trash packs instead of something that might benefit for bosses. The next boss is Hakar, and there's a couple of old school favorites that the original vanilla boss brings, like Corrupted Blood. Players with Corrupted Blood should social distance from others in order not to spread the damage. The boss will also summon adds regularly, and when those adds die, they will form pools on the ground, so be sure to use as much of this room as you can in order to move the boss around. Your tank is going to get hit with piercing barbs, so you'll have to coordinate with the healer and tank on defensives. And be sure to bust through blood barrier as soon as possible to reduce the amount of damage that goes out to your party. The next boss is going to be two of them, Millhouse Manastorm and Maleficent Manastorm. You'll first fight Millhouse with his ability Power Overwhelming, where he summons crystals that will channel into him. Standing in front of those crystals will empower you instead, but you will also take damage. This boss ends up being much of a speed race, so power all your DPS with damage and try to burn through this boss very, very quickly. Millhouse just casts Frostbolts, so you'll try to interrupt him as much as you can so your tank just doesn't get obliterated by magic damage at the beginning. While fighting Millhouse, Maleficent uses Echo Finger Laser Extreme, which will mark two players and will try to draw a line through them. Try to draw this line through Milhouse in order to interrupt his further powerful abilities. After Milhouse is taken out, then comes Maleficent, where she will buzzsaw the tank and stack massive, massive bleeds on your tank. So if you're curing, you might actually be able to deal with this quite easily. She also throws out experimental squirrel bombs, which a healer is supposed to disarm in order to reduce the damage quite heavily. Millhouse during this time will also sometimes cast Shadow Fury on a random party member. Try to line up the Shadow Fury on Maleficent in order to stun her, in order to give your tank a break from getting all those stacks of bleeds, while trying not to get this stun on the rest of your party members, so positionals are going to be very important. Then we have Zyaxa, which is a very similar boss to the Legion version of Karazhan, one of the plays, especially the one that has to do with launching you in the air with the anti-gravity jumps. During this fight, the boss will put up displacement traps, which you'll be using to avoid certain mechanics. The first ability to avoid with these traps is localized explosive contravance, which will mark a player with a bomb icon and they need to be up in the air away from others before the bomb goes off. When the boss casts explosive contravance, then all players should hop into a displacement trap. So make sure not to run over them early in order to make sure everyone has one for this big boss ability. The boss also casts a bit of frontals and on mythic, there was also a bit of a chain mechanic to it. So you'll actually take a lot more damage compared to the other versions. But the boss itself is not super difficult as long as you avoid the other mechanics with the traps. Otherwise, you'll have a very powerful dot that will be very difficult for your healer to keep up with. And finally, we got Muzala, which isn't really a boss fight because you don't actually kill him really. Well, for the most part, once somebody does a lot of the killing, you have to burn through 10% of boss's health at most. The boss will do an ability called Master of Death where he'll start slamming his fists in different directions of the platform. When he turns green, he's going to slam the front of the platform. 
purple, which means left hand, and red means right hand. Just don't stay on the same zone that the corresponding hands are going to slam you with. You also put up debuffs on allies and where it is dispelled, they'll kind of drop down like a time bomb area. So be sure to stay out of there. The boss will also cast an ability called Shadow Reality, during which if you do not take a portal, you will die. So take a portal, and on Mythic you have access to four different portals for four different zones. On those zones, there will be Guardians that guard a totem, which will look like a splitting image of Muzala. Eliminate the ads and interact with the totem, which will buff up your friend Wan Samdi and allow him to do massive damage to Muzala. While he's blasting Mozala, this gives you a massive haste buff in order to catch up on a little bit extra health damage, as your party does still need to do about 10% of this boss's health. Technically on Mythic, if everybody takes four different portals, two next to Mozala and two by the stairs of every platform, you could end up clearing four totems in a single run. So it's going to be a very interesting fight to play through. There's a lot of constant damage for your healer to deal with and your tank is going to get slapped around by this big guy whole fight. So the faster this fight is over, the better. Lastly, we have Tyrna Scythe, which is another Fey dungeon. There are a couple different things that a Fey player might be able to do, like use overground roots in order to create an extra space for you to kind of skip to the next trash pack. You also have an area where you can unlock some mushrooms that can give you a stat buff, as well as a checkpoint system. This dungeon is pretty punishing on checkpoints, so if you don't have someone with a Fey, as long as you don't die, I guess then you don't get punished. The first boss is going to be Ingra Malak, who is a Drusfar who have enslaved a Droman and using the Droman to fight you. So it's going to be like a two-add fight. The way that this fight works is you're supposed to DPS Droman until about 20% when they break free of Ingra's control. Then Droman will turn the attention onto Ingra and put a massive debuff allowing you to do extra damage to Ingra. This is where you will want to do massive massive DPS. Outside of that Droman is going to do a lot of frontals and a lot of AoE damage so use the massive room that you are given in order to kite these two around. Ingra does have a cast that needs to be interrupted regularly and if you fail to take out Ingra fast enough he'll start fearing your group as well as reflecting damage back to shadow. So take down Droman to 20% and burst down Ingra, repeat and refresh. The next fight is going to be against Mistcaller, and Mistcaller is a very interesting fight because prior to it you'll get this puzzle game. The puzzle game will have four different icons and you gotta figure out which one is different than the rest. The icons can either be a leaf or a flower. They can either have a circle around them or no circle, or they can be full as in filled in or translucent, so not full. So you got to figure out which one of these is going to be different because that will be a big player in when fighting the boss Mistcaller. When fighting Mistcaller, there are a couple of mechanics. First, there will be dodgeball where you simply just have to dodge the ball that the boss throws out. Then you have to do patty cake where the tank needs to get an interrupt on the boss, otherwise they get dazed. The boss will also, at certain health thresholds, will play the guessing game where you have to guess which one of the boss's illusions is the real one and which one is the fake one. Find the odd man out. The boss will also summon an ad from time to time to play free stag. It'll be a fox. You can CC this fox and that's what most people do. So that's basically the whole fight. It's a lot of kind of guessing or playing games with them, patty cakes and trying to avoid the foxes that freeze you. And it's a very, very simple fight. Then we have Gahoon 2.0, otherwise known as Treadover. Treadover has a couple different mechanics. First of all, it's going to use a Devourer ability when his health drops low, and he's going to do that twice. While that is happening, a lot of arcane AoE damage is going to be going out, so do a bit of a dance and try to avoid the boss. Try to make sure you get the interrupt before the Devourer is over, and you also need to break through the shield that allows him to devour the Cocoon of Lakali. Another mechanic is going to be his Spits. The more the boss devours, the smarter the boss will get. So at first he'll try to spit where you stand, then he'll try to spit where you last stood, and then the boss will start guessing so there will be a lot more green on the ground. Use this massive room for this boss to move him around. The boss will also try to summon adds, which will focus down on one single target. Just try to nuke the adds as soon as they come out. The boss also needs an interrupt rotation, otherwise they sent out parasites, which will create mind control mechanics. You don't really want to deal with the mind control mechanics to begin with, so make sure you have a kick order. 
and that's going to be all the dungeons. I know this is a very long video, but I wanted to make sure I gave you guys a proper guide for all the dungeons and all the important mechanics that you should watch out for. I've done these dungeons like on three characters so far, and they are actually all very, very enjoyable. I think Shadowlands dungeons, compared to BFA at least, are looking very, very fresh. One thing you'll notice is a lot of these dungeons have massive rooms for you to move bosses around. So that is something for you to consider when running Shadowlands dungeons. But I think there definitely are a fresh take on some of the concepts that we have seen in World of Warcraft time and time again. Super excited to try these dungeons out in Mythic Pluses with all the different affixes. But anyway guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. I do hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts about this guide and I'll see all of you in the next one.